Welcome to Vermont This Week. It is Friday, March 18th, and we are going to be talking about GMO legislation. We are going to be talking about an initiative to help uh, people with criminal backgrounds find employment, and uh, we will be talking about the budget. Uh, joining me right now is Andrea Stanner. Hi, Josh. Nice Stanner. to see you. Uh, she is the executive director of Rural Vermont and also a member of the Vermont Right to Know Coalition. Right. And so, first of all, what is the co 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 the co coalition? Exactly. The coalition is a group of organizations that formed up in uh, late 2012 um, to tackle the issue of providing consumers the right to know uh, what's in their food around genetically engineered food. And it, it, the coalition is comprised of uh, rural Vermont, Vermont Public Interest Research Group, NOFA Vermont, and Cedar Circle Farm, uh, which is an educational organic farm and educational center down in uh, Thetford. Um, so, and plus hundreds of other businesses and organizations joined the coalition as we moved forward with the legislation. So we were the, the grassroots group that drove forward Vermont's uh, GMO labeling law that was passed in 2014. Excellent. And so what's, what's the gist of that, that law? When, is, when, when does it kick in? What's it going to entail? Well, it is scheduled to go into effect this July, July 1st, 2016. That was prescribed in the legislation. And um, it's very simple. It basically says if a food sold in Vermont contains genetically engineered ingredients, that information needs to be disclosed on the label of the package. So it's pretty simple. And so just to play the devil's advocate, why do you think people have the right to know that? Well, because it's a, it's a food is a really fundamental thing. We all eat every day if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we've gone through a period of time where we've learned a lot more about our food, and there's a lot of aspects of our food that we've learned is important. This is another piece of important information that people want to know. People want to know it for health reasons, for religious reasons, uh, for environmental reasons. Um, so it is, it is a crucial piece of information, at least as important as all the other things that are currently disclosed on food labels. So we know that uh, it was certainly a long process to, to create this bill. It mm -hmm. took, uh, I understand, three years, went through six different legislative committees. Mm -hmm. and uh, But since it's been signed into law, it's, it hasn't been exactly smooth sailing. Uh, it's been, it's, been, it's, been, it's, been the, it's been the subject <laughs> yeah. of lit litigation. Correct. And in fact, there was an effort this week in Washington, D.C. to try and uh, n pass legislation that would nullify Vermont's law. Can you tell Correct. us about what happened this week? Sure. This week, uh, we were very lucky in that uh, there was a vote held in the U.S. Senate uh, on a bill that would have uh, basically preempted Vermont's law, mm -hmm. um, and that vote failed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they had to get 60 votes to move that bill forward. They didn't get 60. They only got 48, I think, yeah, 49 to 48. Um, and so we're pleased about that, but um, as Governor Shumlin said in his press conference, we won the battle, not the war. Um, we fully expect that when uh, the Senate comes back after their Easter recess, they will be taking up this bill again. Um, uh, so, you know, we're continuing to have these conversations with senators. Um, there are con conversations continuing across the country. I mean, there are over 30 states that are considering legislation similar to Vermont's. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it's become, it's an interesting issue because it, particularly during this presidential cycle where there's so much division and so much divisiveness in terms of opinions and so on, this is an issue that over 90% of Americans agree on. Over 90, consistently, all the polls say over 90% of Americans would like this information on their food packages. And so yeah. in the face of that, it's really surprising that yeah. the food industry is fighting it as hard as they are. Mm -hmm. the, the Dark Act, as it's known, was defeated, never actually got to the floor for debate. In, it, the Senate, in the Senate, in the Senate, because correct. Because it didn't get the, uh, the cloture vote needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there are some Democratic senators and others who are mm -hmm. working to craft a different bill, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. one that would set a national standard for GMO mm -hmm. labeling rather right. than allowing uh, the federal government to undermine state efforts. Right. Mm -hmm. Where does the coalition stand in terms of a national standard? Right. Well, from the beginning, the, the coalition said what we need is a national standard. Mm -hmm. Congress hasn't been able to deliver that. Right. So that is why the states have stepped up right. to respond to the demands of consumers. And there's lots of examples of this in the past. I mean, there have been many other laws that became federal standards that started out as state laws. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about, oh, we have a patch, we're, you know, we're going to end up with a patchwork of laws. Well, that's not really true because all the laws that have been passed, and there are three so far, Vermont's is the only one that is scheduled to go into effect. Right. But Maine and Connecticut have passed laws as well 
these 30 other states are considering legislation, and Vermont's law has been used as a model mm -hmm. for all those other pieces of state legislation. So there isn't going to be a patchwork. It's going to be very, very consistent across right. the country. Um, but we would all prefer to see a good, strong, mandatory standard that would be no weaker than what mm -hmm. Vermont requires. And we know that Vermont's law, uh, it was upheld at the district, federal yes. district court level. Mm -hmm. It's now in, at the appeals court. Well, what happened is um, the, the, the litigation began in the district court, mm -hmm. and the first moves that were made by the lawyers was uh, the Attorney General of Vermont right. moved to dismiss this lawsuit, and then the Grocery Manufacturers Association filed a motion to get an injunction against Vermont's law. The district court said, no, you're not in imminent harm, you don't get an injunction. So they chose to appeal that ruling up to the uh, federal appeals court, okay. and we're currently waiting for that decision from the appeals right. court. Um, there's certain speculation that part of the reason this huge effort is being made to pass legislation that would undermine the state laws is because they're not at all sure that they're going to win the court right. case. Now, should Vermont's law uh, pass all of the legal tests, all mm -hmm. the legal challenges, mm -hmm. presumably other states will then feel more emboldened to act uh, mm -hmm. and pass their own laws, mm -hmm. at which case do you think Congress would be more inclined to come up with a national standard rather than face a, a patchwork? We can only system. hope, but again, there's not going to be a patchwork. These laws are going to be the, virtually the same. But yeah, we can only hope that once we demonstrate that this can be done, um, and it, there's a lot of fear tactics being used in the face of Vermont's law going into effect. There's talk about, oh, food prices are going to go through the roof, and Vermont's food shelves are going to be empty. And it's just not going to happen. It didn't happen in Europe. There are 64 other countries that have required the labeling of, of genetically engineered food. And none of these things, these scary things, have come to pass. There's no reason that that will come to pass now. Companies change their labels all the time. I mean, who hasn't had the frustration of going into the store looking for a product that you're familiar with and not being able to find it only because they totally changed the label? Um, and they do that all the time. And it's not expensive. It's a cost of doing business. All we're asking for is four simple words, produced with genetic engineering. It's not uh, a warning label. It doesn't imply anything other right. than information. Um, it's like contains salt, you know, yeah. um, contains peanuts. And we should um, note that <laughs> Campbell's Soup agreed to do this voluntarily. Yeah, they chose to. They said, the you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna pay attention to our consumers. Mm -hmm. And many many other companies have chosen to go even further in that they've decided to remove genetic in, genetically engineered ingredients from their food. Um, I mean, I think I saw. This morning, uh, the non-GMO verified project, which is the third party uh, entity that's been labeling things that don't contain genetic engineering or genetically engineered ingredients, they now have their label on something like 87,000 products. Um, I don't know how many there are altogether, probably millions, but. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think this is being driven by a very simple but fundamental fact, which is people have the right to know what's in their food. Um, particularly if they're choosing food for their families and their kids. And uh, it's pretty simple. Excellent. Um, Andrea, thank you so much for, for being here to talk with us about appreciate this. It. We, we, and we'll we keep appreciate you updated it. as yeah. the uh, story goes on. All right. Hey, when <laughs> we come back, uh, my colleague Neil Goswami will be discussing the budget. So, coming up now, we're going to discuss the budget. Uh, my colleague Neil Goswami has been following that, and there's been action this, well, I guess there's been action probably since January. Right. Um, but, uh, but votes so, now. But, but yes, but there, there, there was a vote this week. So yeah. tell us, what's going on with the, with the budget? The House Ways and Means Committee on Wednesday night voted on a tax bill, and uh, it includes about $14 million in new higher taxes. Now, critics of the, the process and critics of the budget will complain that the tax bill is just a fraction of the fees and taxes that are being raised this year. In total, if you look at the fee bill, the transportation bill, the general fund, um, and the tax bill, it's all going to amount to about $48 million as you know it's seen in the House. Now that still has to go through the Senate and changes will be made, uh, but there are a lot of people griping about that total $48 million uh, uh, bottom line. And so they really get there in a number of ways. If you'll recall, Governor Shumlin uh, proposed in his budget address to raise a mutual fund filing fee um, that financial institutions pay to basically sell mutual funds in the state. It's currently at $600, and the governor proposed raising it to $1,200. The, uh, the House Ways and Means Committee actually opted to raise it to $1,500 
for the uh, registration, annual registration fee. Mm -hmm. um, and then they boosted a, a one-time initial registration fee to 2000 All in all, that's gonna raise $20.8 million, which is the biggest chunk, mm -hmm. the biggest single chunk of the new revenue package. So how, how does our registration fee right now compare with others in our, in yeah. our region? So that's a, that's a good question. Right now in Vermont, as I said, it's $600. I know, the only other state I know off the top of my head is Massachusetts, and theirs is, I believe, uh, I want to say around fifteen hundred dollars to okay. two thousand dollars somewhere mm -hmm. in that range. So we are significantly lower than our uh, neighboring states. Mm -hmm. Now you also have to realize that uh, mutual funds are probably much more lucrative in Massachusetts, where they uh, have millions of people, yes. as opposed to the six hundred. 30 million or 1,000 folks in Vermont. Right. So, you know, it's not exactly apples to apples, but uh, the bottom line was lawmakers looked at it and decided, yeah, these financial institutions can probably foot the bill for a little uh, bit more. And, and there are thousands and thousands of mutual funds that Vermonters can uh, participate in here in Vermont. So, so that will raise, as I said, 20.8 million. A couple of other big things. Um, in the transportation bill, fees are being raised, DMV-related fees, by about $10 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, the employer assessment, this is one that's somewhat controversial. They have made changes to the employer assessment, which will raise about $6 million. And the employer assessment is for um, employers who do not provide health insurance coverage to their workers. Mm -hmm. Now, they might provide them for full-time workers, but any worker, part-time or otherwise, that works for them, they'll take those hours worked and come up with a full-time equivalent. So. If you have four workers who work 10 hours a week, mm -hmm. that equals 40 hours, and that's one full-time equivalent. So each quarter, an employer will have to pay currently $151 for each full-time equivalent that doesn't have health insurance. Mm -hmm. under, the, under the changes in the tax bill, um, employers with between one and 19 workers will remain at the $151 assessment, quarterly assessment and between 20 and 99 employers it'll jump to $210 and 100 employers and above will be $249. You add that all together and you know project it out over Vermont's workforce and they expect about six million dollars in, uh, in higher new revenue. Uh, a couple of other things in there, uh, Airbnb and other uh, companies that provide a platform for people to rent uh, their houses or available rooms uh, they are going to try some compliance and get them to actually pay the state's uh, right. rooms tax. And that's going to raise about another million dollars, they believe. Uh, that's, a, that, that's certainly going to require some level of enforcement, I think. Correct. That'll be the, essentially the be the tax level, department right? uh, enforcing existing law. These folks are supposed to be paying the, sure. the tab now, mm -hmm. and they're just not, and there hasn't been an effort to collect it. So they expect to net a million dollars out of that. The gross fuel receipts uh, tax is currently at 0.5%, and that's for things, dealers pay it on things like kerosene, propane, diesel, heating fuel, uh, natural gas. And that's at 0.5%, they're gonna bump that to 0.75%. And all in all, between the general fund and a, and a special fund, that's gonna raise uh, more than $3 million. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you start to add up all these things and you get to that $48 million uh, uh, bottom line and and that's a significant amount of money and uh, you know critics of the of the plan will say well we raised 30 million last year now we're looking at 48 million this year um, it, it might be excessive and as I said it's gonna go you know to the house floor potential changes there uh, it'll then go to the Senate they'll work on it the Senate Finance Committee will work on that and uh, more than likely make some changes so we don't know what the, the end result will be, but we do know that we're looking at a starting point of about 48 million in higher taxes and fees. Time Timetable-wise, are we about where we usually are during this time yeah, of the legislative Yeah, I would think so. If, if anything, maybe a week, week and a half ahead of schedule. Uh -huh. uh, you know, they're they're eyeing a uh, early dismissal from the from you know ending the session. That would be so something. it would be something. I think we're probably on track for early May, first week of May, mm -hmm. which isn't all that early, but you mm -hmm. never know. They could uh, kick it into a higher gear and mm -hmm. once the budget and the uh, tax bills are ironed out, they'll pull the plug on the, this biennium and we'll move full steam into election season. Right on. Yeah. Excellent. Um, there was a, a ban the box bill that you covered this week, which mm -hmm. um, passed overwhelmingly. 
-hmm. And uh, I saw one release from uh, National Federation of Independent Businesses this morning that is against it. But all in all, it seemed to have pretty broad support. Yeah, absolutely. I think the final, final vote, or should I say, the vote yesterday, Thursday, which was the second reading. So there's still, it's still mm -hmm. subject to a final vote today. Right. Uh, but the second reading vote was uh, 138 to five. Okay. Um, so a pretty much as almost as unanimous as you're going to see anything right. uh, come, coming out of the house. And so what this bill does is it prohibits an employer, with some exceptions, it, it, it prohibits an employer from putting that box on a job apl application mm -hmm. form that says, hey, have you been convicted of, of a crime, yes yeah. or no? And so the thought among advocates, uh, especially those who are involved in criminal justice reform, they say that, hey, this is just making employers, they just look at that and they, they're just gonna go ahead and toss it and they're not even gonna invite the person in for an interview. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that uh, don't, don't ask on the app application form and interview the person based upon his or her merits. Right. And then during the job you interview, can, ask them, yeah. hey, do you have a cr criminal record? Now, uh, the House did amend the bill yesterday for some ex exceptions. And so, for example, there are some jobs for which you are disqualified based on federal or state law okay. if you have convictions. I would assume banking. For example, other, yeah. yes, if you have an embezzlement conviction, then you are prohibited from going into the into the banking yeah. sector. So in this case, an employer could specifically ask, do you have a conviction for embezzlement? Mm -hmm. So they couldn't put the box back, say, hey, uh, do you, do you right. have a convicted of a crime? But you can ask about specific crimes. Okay. Um, so you're, you're gonna find, you know, again, somebody who perhaps works with, with the elderly, uh, you know, somebody who has a conviction for el elder abuse would be just disqualified okay. from that as well. And so uh, they received a lot of, a lot, a lot of support. In fact, uh, people with, with criminal convictions in, in the house right. uh, stood up to go ahead and say, yeah, I, de I definitely support this thing. Yeah. Uh, there was de definitely some folks who, who opposed it. Uh, Ron, 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 Ron Hubert. What are the arguments the, that they're the, making? Uh, the argument is, uh, hey, why are we hemming in employers? Uh, they're the ones who drive the economy. Mm -hmm. They should be allowed to do whatever they want, and more, more or less. It's is, a, is, an argument we, we see for most regulations yes. that the, the legislature conjures up, essentially. Mm -hmm. Ab ab absolutely. So uh, Mr. Mr. Huber, who owns a market uh, um, up in uh, Milton, uh, he, he said on, on the floor yesterday that he employs nine people. Two of them have, crip have uh, criminal convictions. Mm -hmm. And on his job application forms, he does not have the so-called box. Okay. Um, however, he says he doesn't want to be told what, what, what to do. He mm -hmm. said uh, you shouldn't be legislating stuff for people who are doing the right thing. Um, but I don't think he's going to pick up a significant number of uh, no votes today. Yeah, looks like a pretty sure bet. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Tuesday was a fun day for, for uh, political reporters. Yeah. We got uh, the first financial disclosure form since last July, last summer. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some interesting things in there. Who are, who are the big money winners? Um, it's hard to say anyone's a loser, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> They've all raised more than $400,000. Mm -hmm. Democrats, uh, Sue Minter, and Matt Dunn did very well. Um, Sue Minter launched her campaign in uh, September. Mm -hmm. And if you'll recall, she was the agency of sec uh, secretary of the Agency of Transportation. And she couldn't begin campaigning or fundraising until she left her position. Um, so between September and March, for March 15th, she raised uh, more money, actually, than Matt Dunn, the other uh, can Democratic candidate, a former Windsor County Senator, uh, did between July and uh, March. So she did very well. They both have a lot of money, cash on hand. Uh, I think for Matt Dunn, it's around $430,000. Uh, for Sue Minter, it was around three hundred. dollars $40,000 or so. And uh, Doug recently re re returned some money. He did, yeah. He made, uh, he made you know, put his uh, foot down and said, I'm not going to take corporate or business uh, contributions. Um, turns out it didn't really hurt him all that much. It was only $16,000 uh, in money that he raised from uh, corporations or businesses. But he did send it back. Uh, none of the other candidates have agreed to do that. He, would, he put out the call for them to follow his lead, and, and they said, uh, you know, no thanks. Uh, most of them say if, if a Vermont business wants to donate to our campaign, we're going to allow it, um, and that's what they've done. On the Republican side, uh, Phil Scott, the lieutenant governor, he raised uh, more than $400,000. Uh, wow. A good chunk of it, hundred and something thousand dollars, actually came from businesses and corporations. Although he had the highest percentage of money from folks living in Vermont. Uh, Bruce Lisman, the, the former Wall Street executive, 
he posted a number of more than six hundred thousand dollars, the most of any candidate, but. Four hundred fifty-three thousand came from his own pocket. Right. He loaned his own campaign two hundred seventy-five thousand um, dollars. He kicked in another one hundred sixty thousand or so in cash, I think, uh, and then he had various in-kind contributions uh, from himself, totaling about seventeen thousand dollars. So they've all got plenty of money to uh, to spend. Um, for some, like Bruce Lesman, he's got a, a deep pocket that he can reach into to to uh, keep. Uh, his campaign going. He's the only candidate that's up on the air with commercials right now, television commercials. But I suspect with the amount of money that they've got available to them, the others will, will soon consider at least uh, radio and television ads. Um, so everyone's got a lot of money. In the lieutenant governor's race, Keisha Rahm, uh, representative from Burlington, Democrat, she raised over $100,000. Uh, uh, Chittenden County Senator Dave Zuckerman, a progressive and Democrat, was running as a Democrat for lieutenant governor, raised about dollars $64,000. Yeah, so he, he hasn't been doing a lot of fundraising, Well, right? so he was limited. What's, what's he was going on? He was trying to qualify for public financing, yet he began, he launched his campaign and began the effort before the statute says you can. And he challenged that in court, hoping that the judge would see it his way and he would be able to continue on. To qualify for public financing, uh, you have to raise $17,000 from in fifty dollar donations uh, or less from every county in Vermont, and you can't start until February fifteenth. Well, he started sooner, um, and he was seeking contributions of fifty dollars or less, mm -hmm. so that might have hindered his uh, his initial fundraising effort. I fully expect now that he's been uh, sort of uh, cut loose from the uh, public financing law, and he he will go out and raise significantly more money. And, and some will be higher amounts, more than the $50 that he was limited to. So when the next financial report is filed in July, July 15th, I believe, I, I expect to see he, him catching up with uh, Representative Rahm a little bit more. And so to be clear, we don't have any candidates who are currently in, in the race who are using pub public financing, right? Not this right? year, not this year. Last year, uh, two years ago, we had Dean Corrin, mm -hmm. a progressive qualify for public financing as a per, um, in the lieutenant governor's race. But this year, nobody is, uh, to my knowledge, is actively uh, pursuing it. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for the, for the update. Yeah, my that pleasure. Great. And so that's that's our show here this this week here at the State House. Um, joining me, thank you, Neil. As as always, we yep. really really appreciate it. Um, so our show here at Capital Beat is a joint production between the Vermont Press Bureau, that's us, and Orca Media. You can find our show online at vermontpressbureau.com or orcamedia.net. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.